Okay, the final talk of this morning, uh, this morning, when I now announce the Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire, <laughs> you are not in the wrong auditorium. I could also welcome the woman for outstanding achievements in the year of 2009. And I could also mention another winner of the Darwin Wallace Medal in 2008. And all the awards and prizes and uh, some more refer to the same pe uh, person, namely to Professor Linda Partridge from the University College of London and the director of the Institute for Healthy Aging. That's already an interesting name. Uh, Linda is a geneticist and her main interest is in the evolution and the mechanisms of aging, a field that is definitely attractive, important, and it is so important that the German Max Planck Gesellschaft has recently founded an institute for the research in aging and the founding director and the real director is Professor Linda Partridge. She hasn't moved to Cologne yet, where the institute is already, because as she told me last night, the lab conditions are not yet ideal. The Drosophila lab has a temperature of 80 degrees centigrade, and that's not the optimal temperature for Drosophila. Uh, but you will move there and uh, be the director in the near future. I also Googled on Linda this morning. And I found one link which said, Professor Linda Partridge, fellow of the Royal Society, which by the way, uh, Tim is also a fellow, dash, the key to longer life. <laughs> and then I clicked that link, and what came up was, this page doesn't exist. <laughs> So maybe, Linda, you tell us the key now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ali, for that uh, nicely embarrassing introduction. <laughs> As Peter pointed out, you have a way of finding us out. You find those sore spots and go for them. And I don't know who slipped you the information about the dame, but thank you anyway. And it's an enormous pleasure and privilege to take part in this absolutely stunning series of lectures. I've learned such a lot over the last two days. It's been fantastic. So of course, I'm going to talk about aging. And as far as I know, it's not a topic that Darwin himself thought about at all, probably because at the time he was working, there was so little information about natural lifespans. He probably didn't have the opportunity to speculate much. But I think it's actually a trait that we can only understand by thinking about how it's evolved. And also, um, the title of the talk is an indication that it's an area of research that's changed an enormous amount in recent years as a result of some, to us, quite surprising discoveries, which I'll describe. And of course, ageing is in the news a lot because of the increase in human life expectancy. It's a trend that started in westernised societies in the middle of the 19th century, and it's been going on at a very steady rate ever since of about two and a half years increase in life expectancy per decade, about six hours a day, if you like. And it's illustrated here um, by the work of some demographers, and what's been plotted is life expectancy at birth, and it's for the country that was the leader in the world at the time. So that was mainly the Scandinavian countries at the beginning of the survey. By the end, it was mainly Japan, and you can see this amazing linear increase. And there's no indication at all of an approaching wall of death at the moment. The demographers can't see what the intrinsic limit on human lifespan is actually going to be. These are just various predictions that were made, um, giving an indication of the uh, point at which the lifespan increase was predicted to uh, level out and the time at which the prediction was made. And they've all been surpassed by events. It's just carrying on up. And at the moment, it's mainly being fueled by increases in survival in the older sections of the population. Initially, it was more the young. And, of course, this is leading to some quite remarkable lifespans. Um, this is the official world record holder at the moment. Um, she was a French woman called Jean-Louise Calmont, 
and she died in 1997 at the age of 122 and a half. She actually met Van Gogh in her father's shop as a young woman. They sold paint, and he used to go there to buy it. And it's not at all clear to what she owes this remarkable feat. Why her? Um, she came from quite a long-lived family pedigree. Human lifespan's about 25% heritable. Um, but on the other hand, she really wasn't a very good advertisement for the kind of um, healthy living that one might expect to be associated with this. Um, she actually quit smoking when she was 119. <laughs> so, <laughs> so who knows what her secret was? But, of course, she and the general increase in life expectancy, I think, have to be regarded as a real triumph of human civilization as a result of improvements in medical care and <coughs> lifestyle. People are staying healthier as they get older. It's often said that today's 60-year-olds are like the 40-year-olds of a century ago, and so they're living longer. But it is nonetheless coming with rather a mixed press, and the reason for that is the diseases that are associated with older ages. All of the major killer diseases, cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, are very strongly ageing-related. Um, and as for most countries, there's been an estimate for how dementia is going to go in Britain over the coming years. This was um, a combined forecast from the London School of Economics and the Institute of Psychiatry. And about 1.7 million in the UK are going to have dementia by the middle of this century, unless we can do something about it. And that's out of a population of about 70 million. And, of course, that's just one of these diseases. So, as a result of that, there's considerable pressure on the biomedical community to try and do something about people's health as they age, because that's where the major burden of ill health in societies is now falling. But, really, the prospects for doing anything about it have looked rather unpromising. And there are two reasons for that. One of them is that it's an extremely complex looking process. So this is simply part of a table that was um, drawn up some years ago by George Martin, who's a pathologist working on aging in the United States. And he just made a list of all the human tissue systems and the things that can go wrong in them during aging. And I'm putting it up not to depress us, but just to emphasize the complexity of the process. So what you see is a lot of different and not obviously connected things going wrong in a single tissue, and also the things that go wrong in different tissues are quite different from each other. Just looking at this lot, you wouldn't think that there was any single underlying process giving rise to all of these. It looks rather as though, in accordance presumably with the kind of insults of daily living that they encounter, different tissues are getting different things going wrong with them, and we've got lots of different aging processes going on in parallel as a result of accumulation of various kinds of damage as lifespan goes through. And, of course, if that were true, it would carry a very pessimistic message, because what it would say is that there are no experimental interventions that you can make to try and understand the underlying aging process, because it doesn't exist. And also, by the same token, we can't intervene into it medically. What we'd be looking at, at best, would be piecemeal intervention into each of these, leaving the rest of them largely unaffected. The other reason, I think, for pessimism about ageing actually comes from considering how it evolves. And as Tim has just pointed out in his beautiful talk, there's considerable diversity in lifespan in the rate of ageing in nature. These are just some additional um, mammalian examples to some of the ones that he showed us, um, chosen partly to uh, just knock on the head the idea that there's some sort of inevitable association between size and lifespan, the idea that an animal has to be big in order to live a long time. So as far as I know, amongst mammals, this bowhead whale is actually the record holder at about 200 years. They are actually aged from the age of the harpoon heads that are found embedded in the animals. And, and generally, small mammals, although, not, as we've seen, not naked mole rats, tend to be rather short-lived. Um, this isn't the shortest. I mean, some shrews just live a matter of weeks. But look at this bat. It only weighs eight grams. You can see it sitting on somebody's fingertip here, yet it can live nearly 40 years in nature. And it's not a hibernating bat. This isn't a story of uh, reduced metabolic intensity. In fact, bats are generally very long-lived for their body size amongst mammals. And as we'll see, birds are long-lived relative to mammals. So this um, loose correlation between size and lifespan that does exist can be very easily broken during evolution. We're not just looking at a trait that's an inevitable side effect of body size. And in fact, it isn't an inevitable trait at all. Um, this dahlia anemone, as far as anyone can see, doesn't age at all. 
its survival it doesn't uh, go down with age, and nor does its fertility. So it, it's possible to get completely non-aging organisms. That's true also of um, the somewhat distantly related freshwater hydra. They don't seem to age at all either. So we're looking at a trait that has a genetic basis. These differences persist if we put the animals in benign conditions in captivity, and it can clearly evolve to different values and different lineages. But if we stop and think about that for a minute, it really poses an evolutionary paradox. How can a deleterious trait evolve by natural selection? It's quite clear that aging is a deleterious trait. So it's regularly seen in nature. We can actually see the declines in survival probability and infertility in wild populations. So it's there for natural selection to act on. And I think we've now largely discounted various ideas that have been put forward that somehow aging is good for the species or good for the group. These are very weak forms of selection compared with the selection on individuals to keep reproducing. So there's no doubt that selection should act to eliminate aging in nature. It's an individually disadvantageous trait. And because of this paradoxical nature, aging actually attracted the attention of some very clever people very early on. Two of them in my own institution, University College London. So Peter Medawa is actually much better known in the immunology community as the discoverer of the mechanism of immune tolerance that set up and hence um, opening the way to being able to do uh, human transplants. Um, but he had a side interest in the evolution of aging, as did uh, JBS Haldane, who we've already seen hectoring a political crowd. Um, we've got him here now in what I think of his more natural habitat, which is the Haldane Lecture Theatre at University College. And what these two cooked up between them was to point out that even a potentially immortal animal is nonetheless going to die because of the impact of extrinsic hazard. So disease, predation, and accidents are going to limit the potential for longevity in any particular environment and any particular species. And if we impose on that the idea of new mutations coming into the population, and we know that's happening all the time as a result of copying errors um, during the transmission of the germline, some of these mutations are probably going to be age-specific in their effects. They're going to affect individuals only after certain ages. And the one that Haldane was particularly interested in was Huntington's disease. This is a neurodegenerative disease in humans, and its average age of onset is about 35 years old. And what Haldane pointed out was that most of the individuals that are carrying that mutation at birth, at least in human history, would have completed their family size before the effects of the mutation became apparent. And also, a lot of them would have died. And in general, a mutation that has its effect expressed in old individuals will only be expressed in a minority of the individuals that originally carried it, because most of them will have died of extrinsic hazard already. And what that means is that the capacity of natural selection to push mutations like that out of the population is reduced, because it can't see most of the copies that are there in the first place. And that's called mutation accumulation, the idea that nasty mutations that affect the older at higher frequency, and that's what's causing the aging process. There's also a second route that could do it, and this was pointed out by George Williams, very known uh, evolutionary biologist working at Stony Brook. And what George suggested was that there could exist a class of mutations that's beneficial to young individuals, so perhaps increases their survival or reproductive success, but does so at the cost of causing a higher rate of aging later on. So that's called the pleiotropy to gene effects, or sometimes the trade-off theory of aging. And a mutation like that can be incorporated into a population just by natural selection, because the natural selection will act more strongly on the early benefit than on the late higher rate of aging, for the reason that I've just given, the decline in natural selection with age. So what they both say is that the intrinsic rate of aging will evolve in accord with the level of extrinsic hazard that's present in the environment, but in the case of mutation accumulation, different parts of the life history are free to evolve independently of each other, whereas in George Williams' idea, the early and late events in adult life are tied quite closely together. And there's been a lot of interest in testing the relative importance of the contribution of those two to aging in practice. And I'm going to cut to the chase and talk particularly about the trade-off idea, because it turns out definitely to be very important. 
And the organism where this was initially tested experimentally is the one where I do most of my own work, the fruit fly, Drosophila. And uh, you'll see it's a quite extraordinarily beautiful creature. <laughs> And it also has um, one useful characteristic in common with humans, which is that it's an outbreeder. It's a diploid outbreeder. So its populations harbour high levels of just natural genetic variation. And what people have done is to ask experimentally whether this genetic variation does have this property of tying up different parts of the life history. And the way that this has been tested, particularly powerfully, I think, is by a form of artificial selection, which was invented by Michael Rose and Brian Charlesworth. And what they do is to contrast young lines, which are cultured just very much like ordinary fly cultures in any fly lab. So the eggs are laid, the adults emerge, and as soon as they mature, they produce the eggs that will give rise to the next generation. So all the breeding in these lines is by young adults, and selection on the later part of adulthood is completely relaxed. And they're contrasted with old lines where everything's the same up to the time that the adults come out, but they're then hulled in mixed groups for about a month. They produce eggs during that period, but the eggs produced during the time are discarded. They play no part in the future of the selection line. So the flies have to survive this whole period, and there's death during it, and they have to be fertile at the end of it in order to contribute eggs to the next generation. So compared with the young lines, the old lines are selected for slow aging. So we're expecting, if there's genetic variation for the rate of aging in fly populations, that it will slow down relatively in the old lines. And if Williams is right, what we're expecting is that these old lines are going to pay for their slow aging somehow. Something's going to go wrong with the earlier part of their life history. So here's one example of what happens if we do this. This was work done by Carlos Scro uh, some years ago at UCL. These are mortality rates. So this is a log mortality rate plot. Each age is represented independently of each other age, and it's the proportion of the individuals that enter each age class that die during it, plotted on a log scale. And it's for a set of young lines in blue and old lines in gold. And you can see that in both, death rates go up approximately exponentially with age, uh, much as they do in humans. But after about 15 generations of selection, the rate at which they go up has been slowed down in the old lines. So we can slow down the rate of aging by artificial selection. And what Carla went on to do was to look very carefully at the earlier part of the adult period, and what she found was that both the males and the females of the old lines were less fertile. So there was a strong tie-up within these fly populations between reproductive rate and the rate of aging. And Carla actually went on to show that if she uh, sterilized the flies, she could actually abolish the difference in the rate of aging. And what she had was a high rate of reproduction leading to a delayed increase in death rate. Of course, these are just flies, and it's also a very short evolutionary distance. We're more interested in uh, mammals more similar to ourselves, um, and also larger evolutionary distances are similar things going on. And for this, we have to go to the comparative method. And I've already mentioned to you that birds and bats are long-lived for their body size. And this graph simply illustrates that. This is work that's done by Andy Purvis, who has collected up a lot of information about uh, mammalian life histories, and Peter Bennett, who's an expert on bird life histories. And what's plotted here very simply is the average body weight of a species. Each spot is a species and its annual adult survival. And you can see that within both the mammals and the birds, there's an approximate relationship. It's a very noisy relationship, but it's nonetheless there between lifespan and body size. But for a given body weight, the bird spots tend to be above the mammal spots, simply illustrating that per body weight, birds live longer than mammals do, and the bats in the sample are well up here with the birds. And what Andy and Peter wondered very simply was whether this very large and rather noisy data set um, could be explained more concisely by looking at the reproductive rate of the species that are present in it. And they found that it could. So what we have plotted here now is annual adult survival, measure of slow aging, but this time against the annual number of offspring that's produced by that species. And you can see that an awful lot of the noise disappears. First of all, we've got this strong, curvilinear, negative relationship between lifespan and production of offspring. So long-lived things produce fewer offspring. 
And furthermore, the birds and the mammals seem to be lying right on top of each other now. And if we do a full statistical analysis of these data, what it tells us is that reproductive rate is the only variable that has any explanatory power for lifespan. Neither whether the thing's a bird or a mammal or how heavy it is has any explanatory power beyond reproductive rate. And we could do a similar plot, and we have done for age at first breeding, and the same thing happens. So, of course, these are just correlational data, but it looks, again, as though even over these large evolutionary distances, reproductive rate is an important player in the evolution of ageing. So what's all this told us? First of all, it's telling us that ageing is simply evolving as a side effect of other things, basically of the inability of natural selection to prevent it, either in the face of mutation pressure or a trade-off with events earlier in life. Um, Trade-offs and particularly the cost of reproduction seem to be important. And I think very importantly, ageing is not a programme process like development. So development has a well-oiled hierarchy of genetic control, which we've heard about from Yanni, to make sure that the right things happen in the right place at the right time. Ageing is not like that. It's a much more haphazard process because no genes have evolved to cause damage and death. Selection, if anything, is for continued longevity. And the conclusion from this for a long time has been that rather similarly to its phenotypic complexity, variation in the rate of ageing is likely to have a complex genetic basis. It seemed intuitively very unlikely that it would be possible to reduce the rate of ageing by making a lesion in a single gene, because we know that survival and fertility are affected by all the genes in the genome, or the gene would die. So that is where matters stood until quite recently. And I think what has changed is the realisation that this rather pessimistic view is actually incorrect. And that discovery came from work with these guys, the laboratory model organisms. Um, they're the workhorses, obviously, of uh, modern biomedicine. And the reason that they're so useful is, first of all, their experimental you know, tractability and all the reagents that have been developed for working with them, but also the very strong evolutionary conservation of mechanisms of processes like metabolism, um, genetic transmission, neural transmission, and so on. And that means that we can learn to understand how things work in humans by looking at much simpler organisms. So typically what we do is start with something single-celled, a bacterium or a yeast, then proceed to the worm, which is a very tractable invertebrate system, then to the rather more complicated fly, and only then to the mammal. And often we find that we can take a gene from one of these organisms or from a human and put it into another, and it works perfectly normally there. But it was thought for a long time that this would not be so for ageing. I mean, why should these very different organisms with their different diets, respiratory systems, um, warm-blooded mammals and so on, age in the same way? Why should the insults of daily living be similar in these very different kinds of organisms? And eventually, my personal hero in all this, rather than thinking about it too much, just got on with it and did the experiment. He worked with Cenorhabditis elegans. He was called Michael Klass. And what he did was a very simple chemical mutagenesis experiment. He induced new mutations in the worm, and he asked if any of them could extend lifespan. And what he found was that they could. This was published in a very uh, modest journal in 1983. It's a very clear description of the mutants. It's also clear from reading the paper that it got a terrible kicking during the editorial process. People were very reluctant to believe the information in the paper. And about five years later, another lab actually in the same department had a closer look at some of these mutants, cleaned them up from second sight hits, and described in more detail one of them, which became known as age one. And these mutants turned out not only to be long-lived as adults, but they had another peculiarity, which is that they tended to go into a form of developmental arrest, which worms do in response to hard time during development. And based on that, Cynthia Kenyon's lab also did a screen, and they managed to isolate a different mutation that doubled the lifespan of the worm, and it only did so when another gene was present and correct. So here we've got these lifespan-extending genes and another gene that has to be there for them to do their trick. And eventually they were cloned and sequenced, and somewhat to everyone's surprise, they turned out to encode this invertebrate's insulin, insulin growth factor-like signaling pathway, much better known, of course, in mammals for effects on metabolism and blood glucose and on growth. But now, clearly the same pathway turning up in an invertebrate and having an effect on lifespan. So 
this doubling mutant here turned out to be the single uh, worm insulin receptor. The H1 turned out to be another component of the pathway, the PI3 kinase. And the gene that had to be there for them to extend lifespan turned out to encode this thing called a forkhead transcription factor. What it does very simply, it lives, um, it, it migrates in and out of the nucleus according to circumstances, and when it's in the nucleus, it controls transcription of genes. So the implication is that these genes are controlling lifespan by altering the way in which DAF16 alters gene expression. So this is a pathway that can regulate the activity of a lot of different genes at once. And I should say that the differences in lifespan, particularly in the worm, can be huge. So this is a survival curve now, a cumulative survival plot for the two controls, the hermaphrodite worms and the male worms. Worms consist of hermaphrodites and males. And this is for a single mutation in the receptor. And you can see you can get a very large increase in median and maximum lifespan in the hermaphrodites and absolutely colossal in the males. Also importantly, they stay active and healthy for longer. So these guys are wriggling around, looking pretty youthful, long after all the controls are dead. It's not just an extension of the moribund period at the end of life. So this was all pretty exciting, but because of the tie-up with the developmental arrest, it was thought that maybe it would be a worm peculiarity. And eventually it became possible to ask the question in Drosophila. And the reason for that was that the pathway came to light there, not because of anything to do with its effect on aging, but because it's very important in control of growth and size in the fly. So as a result of that, a lot of nice mutants were produced, and eventually our lab and uh, Mark Tater's lab at Brown University rounded up some of them and put them on a standard genetic background and had a look at their effect on lifespan. And Mark's lab found that just as in the worm mutations in the insulin receptor homologue in the fly could extend lifespan, we looked at a gene called Chico, which means uh, small boy in Spanish, because of the developmental effect of the pathway on the fly. And we again found that uh, simply knocking that gene out completely uh, could produce a substantial increase in lifespan. We strongly suspect that the effects on growth and the effects on lifespan are quite independent of each other. These are just two things that the pathway does, rather than there being any causal connection, because the heterozygous flies are normal in body weight, but they're almost as long-lived as the homozygotes, so they clearly don't need to be small in order to live a long time. And one thing that's interesting about the pathway is that the mutants tend to extend lifespan much more in females than in males. We don't know why that is, but it's a very consistent finding. And also, very extreme mutants have an effect on fertility. So these herbozygous chico females are actually completely sterile. So again, there's this tie-up between lifespan and reproduction. But obviously, the main interest in these results was the implication that we might be seeing evolutionary con conservation of the effects of the pathway. And it's beginning to look as though this is, in fact, the case in mice. So these are the first... Uh, papers that have come out from the mice, um, two showing that uh, a mouse that's ubiquitously heterozygous for a null mutation in the IGF-1 receptor is long-lived, interestingly only the females, not the males, and they're also resistant to oxidative stress, which is a quite consistent correlate of lifespan extension by the pathway. Um, this one is a complete knockout of the insulin receptor in the white adipose tissue of the mouse, and the mouse is lean and long-lived. And then these two more recently are beginning to imply that both insulin and IGF signaling in the brain may be particularly important in this lifespan extension story. But obviously one of the things that we're particularly interested in in the mammalian situation is what the health status of these animals is during aging, because that's what we're after, an improvement in health during aging. And for that, I'd like to show you a paper that actually came up from our consortium in London. I have a long-term and uh, extremely enjoyable collaboration with David Gems, who runs a worm lab, and Dominic Withers, who runs a mouse lab. And Colin Selman in Dominic's lab led a mouse study where they made essentially a Chico mouse. They completely knocked out the insulin receptor substrate 1. And here you can see what that did to the survival of the females. This, again, is a survival curve. And you can see that there's a very nice extension of mean and maximum lifespan. These are females. The males show an extension of lifespan, but again, it's less. But what I think was important about this study was that Colin and these many collaborators went on to look at specific as aspects of the health and disease of the animals as they aged. And what they found was that although there was very little difference when the animals were young, as they went into middle and old age, the IRS1 knockouts had better glucose homeostasis, 
they had a better immune profile, they had more naive T cells, and their motor function was better. You can measure this by putting the mouse on a rotating rod and seeing how fast you can rotate the rod before it falls off. And the um, IRS-1 mice maintain their ability to do that much better as they get older. And of course, there's no obvious connection between these three traits. It looks like quite a broad spectrum improvement. And also, they're resistant to some specific pathologies that they looked at. So they show a delayed onset of osteoporosis and also of cataracts. And of this ulcerative dermatitis, which this particular strain of mouse is quite prone to. So what we've got here are 600-day-old litimates, the control animal here and the IRS-1 here. And you can see the control's got quite bad cataracts. This one's looking very chipper. About a third of these mice get the ulcerative dermatitis as they age, whereas the, uh, these IRS-1 mice never get it. We've never seen a case. So I think this is what interests me about it. It's this broad spectrum improvement in the health of the animals as they age. And that has led on to a quite strong interest in looking at the mechanisms by which the aging process is interacting with the disease process in some of these model organisms. And I'll just show you one study on that, which I find particularly impressive. It's actually um, a study on the worm that was done in Andy Dillon's lab on a model that was produced by Chris Link. It's a model of Alzheimer's disease in a very loose sense in the worm. What they've done is to misexpress, but in the muscles of the worm rather than its nervous tissue for technical reasons, um, the A-beta peptide, which is a very major player in Alzheimer's disease in humans. It's the A-beta 1 to 42 variety. And what they found when they did that was that they induced an age-related paralysis in the worm. So you can see that this worm looks pretty strange. Its front end is wiggling around in a somewhat um, feeble manner, and its back end is completely paralyzed, and that gets worse and worse with age. And what Andy Dillon's lab wanted was, well, what would happen if we combined this disease model with one of these long-lived mutants? And this is what happened when they did that. We've seen the disease worm already. This is what happens when they add in a mutant in the insulin receptor in the worm. You can see that they've completely restored wild-type function in the worms. It's an absolute colossal improvement in health. And they actually went on to do a genetic analysis, which one could do so powerfully in the worms, looking at what the specific mechanisms were by which this toxic peptide was being rendered harmless in these long-lived mutants. So again, this is something that's very much growing. There have been some similar studies with mice, and also in the worm, protection has now been seen in a model of cancer as well. So I think this is going to be a profitable and powerful way in to trying to find out what the mechanisms at work are here. But of course, eyes now are on humans. And this is just some of the population genetic work that's come out recently, um, looking at associations between genetic variants of the human equivalents of these genes that are involved in the aging story in the model organisms. And particularly this one, FOXO3A. So this is another of these forkhead transcription factors. It's a direct human equivalent of the forkhead in the worm. And in three independent studies now, there have been quite strong genetic associations between particular variants in the gene that encodes it and lifespan in humans. So perhaps the story is going to turn up there as well. So I think this is the first and the best studied of these pathways. It's clear that the closely related TOR pathway is also a major player, and I expect there will be others. And clearly this is um, generating almost as many questions as it's answering. One of the ones that's interested me is the role of these pathways, the insulin signaling pathway and the IGF-1 pathway, a classic nutrient sensing pathways. What they do is to detect the nutritional status of the animal and match costly activities like growth and reproduction to how much nutri nutrition is available. And it's been known for a long time that something called dietary restriction can also extend lifespan. So this was originally discovered in rodents, actually in rats, in about 1935. So if you simply take a rat and put it on a diet, so you force it to eat about half of what it would take in voluntarily, then you get a major increase in lifespan, and you also see this broad spectrum improvement in health. It's much better documented uh, for dietary restriction than it is for these mutants, simply because it's been known about for so much longer. And it also works in mice. And people have therefore been interested in producing invertebrate models, and in fact, dietary restriction has been shown to extend lifespan in all of these different organisms. And just earlier this year, 
the results for rhesus monkeys have started to come out. Um, there was a very nice paper in Science from the Weindruck Lab. Um, these are simply two of the animals that were present in that study. It's the long-term National Institute of Aging study. Um, the animals are now, now about 19 years old when this picture was taken. And uh, you can see the control animal on the left and the somewhat more slender-looking, dietarily restricted one on the right. And not only do these animals live longer, but they actually have um, better health status as well as they age. So at least as far as uh, rhesus monkeys, it seems to work. Unclear with humans, there are no experimental studies with humans except very short-term ones where some improvements in health have been seen. Um, there are a number of humans who um, voluntarily dietarily restrict themselves. One often meets them at ageing conferences, and I think the main thing I'd say about them is that they look absolutely miserable. Um, <laughs> Their body temperature drops about two degrees, and they're constantly hungry. It just doesn't go away. So it's clearly not an easy thing to do. <laughs> but there are nonetheless some interesting just cultural anecdotes, really. I think the main one of these is the Okinawan Japanese. Um, Okinawa is an island right down in the south of the Japan archipelago. And they actually have the highest fraction of centenarians in the world, even higher than mainland Japan, which is already very high, 18 and a half in 100,000. And the interesting thing about them is that they just seem to have a dietary restriction culture. Nobody really understands how this can be. But children eat 60% of the recommended calories, which is already low for Japanese. And the adults, about 80% extremely frugal eaters. I, I've been there and observed this phenomenon, and also the, the fact that they seem extremely useful for their age. I thought my host was in his 40s, and he was actually in his 60s. So this has long been an interesting phenomenon, and I think the thing that we'd like to understand a bit better now is whether these nutrient-sensing pathways are part of the same phenomenon, or are we looking at one and the same thing? And that's something that uh, we've been trying to do a little bit of experimental work on in the fly, because flies respond quite nicely to dietary restriction. So the way that we do it is uh, simply to dilute that brown gel that some of you will have seen that flies are generally cultured on. It usually contains a mixture of yeast and sugar, sometimes a complex carbohydrate source. And what we can do is simply take the food and dilute it. And strangely enough, the flies don't increase their intake rate in response to that. They just take it as it's given. And uh, what we see as we dilute the food is that the green bars of fecundity, fecundity goes shooting down. And as we dilute it, lifespan, which is the orange line, goes up. And then if we overdo it, it falls off a cliff on the left through starvation. So the dietary restriction phenomenon is here. It's this range over which as you decrease food intake, lifespan goes up, but fecundity goes down. The two are, again, going against each other. This just illustrates it for a number of strains in, in flies. We actually work with these strains up here because you can see, I think, just eyeballing, that they have um, a, a much better combination of fertility and lifespan, that they're fitter flies. And the reason for that is the way that we culture them. They're kept in population cages, so they live out a normal life history, whereas these various laboratory and bred strains just tend to be banged over as soon as they're... Um, reproductively mature. So, so we're a bit careful about the kinds of flies that we work with. And we know quite a bit about this response. As I've said, they don't um, compensate with their intake rates. We also call it dietary restriction because we know it's not just calories in the food that are important. And in fact, uh, lifespan and fecundity are responding to different nutrients in the food. So this response in fecundity is entirely induced by methionine, whereas all of the essential amino acids contribute to the change in lifespan. So they're being controlled by different nutrients in the food. But what we wanted to know was what the role of the insulin pathway might be in these responses. And for this, we decided to look at the insulin ligands in the flies. So one of the nice things about working with a model organism is that we've actually got eight different Drosophila species in which the whole genome has been sequenced. So we can go a long way back and look at the evolution of gene families. And the story with the insulins in the flies is that all of these species have seven genes that encode insulin ligands. This is a very stable gene family with very little gene turnover. Clearly, these ligands had differentiated from each other 45 million years ago before the different fly species uh, started to do so. Uh, this just shows the molecular structure of one of the ligands. They're called Drosophila insulin-like peptides, or DILPs, and they look like insulin. Simply, the conservation of different region of the regions of the molecule implies that they're cleaved like insulins. And we became interested in three of these insulins in 
melanogaster, which is the main model organisms, because they're made in a particular group of cells in the brain of the fly. So this is a fly brain with the optic lobe. And there's this group of neurosecretory cells that make three of these seven fly insulins. This is just an enlargement of the cells. And a number of years ago, Sue Broughton actually ablated these cells. What she did was to arrange to express a gene that causes programmed cell death in the cells, in them. Um, and that resulted in a more or less total, but not absolutely total, ablation of the cells. About a third of the RNA transcript levels for these three insulin genes were left in the brains of these flies on average. Some of them had none, some had a few cells left. So it's a reduction rather than a complete knockout. And what she found when she did that was that she got all the phenotypes that were typical of the insulin pathway. So the flies were long-lived, particularly in the females. They had reduced fertility. They were resistant to various stresses, including oxidative stress. And they had various metabolic phenotypes, including diabetes, interestingly enough. These flies have elevated blood glucose. So this was an interesting indication that these three insulins might be playing a role in lifespan. So what we did was to go on and look at that directly by knocking out the genes. And again, the lovely thing about working on a model organism is you've got very powerful method methods for gene manipulation. So Sebastian Grunk in the lab actually knocked out all of the genes for these fly insulins. So there's a group of insulins on the third chromosome and another two on the X chromosome. And to do this, you use homologous recombination. You literally recombine into the fly genome a null mutation for the gene of interest. So you have these targeting vectors. And what Sebastian did, taking advantage of the fact that the genes are next to each other, was to knock them out singly and in various uh, combinations. And for the three that we're interested in, the results are shown here. This shows what happened at the transcript level. So in each putative mutant in DILP2, the DILP2 transcripts missing, three, three's missing, and so on. And the same for the proteins, looking with antibodies. So he's made this very nice set of DILP reagents. And of course, what we wanted to know was what happens when you knock out DILPs 2, 3, and 5, because they're the ones that are produced in those cells that Sue Broughton ablated and got the interesting phenotypes. And what Sebastian found was that he got a nice big increase in lifespan and also a complete blocking of the response to dietary restriction. So what's plotted here is the lifespan response to food dilution. You've seen this already. So this is the response in the controls. So lifespan rises to a peak here. You can see that in the um, flies where the three insulin genes have been knocked out. First of all, there's a stonking rate increase in lifespan, especially in the females, and their response to um, increasing food is absolutely flat. There's no decline in lifespan at all as you increase their nutrition, and there's also no increase in their fecundity. So clearly, at some level, these insulin ligands are major players in the response to dietary restriction in the fly, and we would like to know, of course, whether this is also going to be true in mammals. It's very difficult to pin this on any one of the three ligands, and the reason is that there's an extremely complex feedback system within those cells with the expression of one gene affecting the others. So if you knock out one, the others compensate. So it's very difficult to control them individually. So at least in flies, it looks as though these newly discovered nutrient-sensing pathways may explain this much older phenomenon of dietary restriction. Finally, what I'd like to do is to just come on to consider whether what these mutations are doing is really decreasing the rate of aging, which, as I've said at the beginning, um, didn't seem very likely. It's clear that they're improving health during aging in a quite broad-spectrum way, but are they doing it by reducing the rate of aging? And the way that we've looked at that is um, by examining demography. I'll explain what I mean. So one can increase lifespan in flies in various ways. And what we've got here is the mortality rate plots that you've already seen um, for two of them. So Drosophila is an ectotherm. It's so small that it has immediately to adopt the temperature of its environment. It can't th thermoregulate at all. It's too tiny. And in ectotherms like that, if you cool them down within a reasonable physiological range, they live longer, so lifespans ex extended at lower temperature, presumably as a result of a general decrease in everything that's going on inside the fly. Every biochemical process has a Q10, and that presumably includes the rate of aging. So we would expect temperature a priori to have an effect on the rate of aging. And we, if we look at the mortality plots that result from cooling flies down, they tend to confirm that. So we've seen that death rates increase exponentially with age. And this red line is for flies that are kept in the warm. warm. 
If we put them in the cool, then what we see, as I say, is an increase in lifespan. And the reason for that is that the rate at which mortality increases with age is greatly decreased. The slope of the line is dropped. So things get worse with age more slowly in the cold, just like every other physiological process. Interestingly, the effects of diet and the effects of insulin mutants are quite different. So what we see instead is, again, the exponential increase in the controls. But there's a delay before the age-related increase in death rate starts with diet, and it then goes up in parallel with the controls. So there's no change in the slope. And this here is a floor effect. This is a detection effect. Basically, the minimum mortality rate that you can detect depends on how many flies you've got. So it takes longer to come up above the floor, but then it goes up at the same rate. And interestingly, these two thumbprints of these two processes are associated with very different underlying effects on the physiology of the fly. So it turns out that the effects of temperature are permanent. They really are affecting the rate of aging-related damage. So we've seen these control plots before. The way that we can ask whether the thermal history of the fly has any effect on its death rate is to reverse the thermal status of the flies partway through life. Because if we make flies warm for the first time, we then have two groups of flies that are both now warm, but one's been warm in the past and the other hasn't. And the later we do it, the bigger the historical difference between them. And if you do that with flies, what we find is if we take a subgroup of these cool flies and make them warm for the first time, the mortality plot just tilts up to become parallel to that of the permanently warm flies. So, of course, what that means is for a given chronological age, these flies are permanently protected from death by this history of having been in the cold. And it doesn't matter how late we do this, the same thing happens. They just tilt up to become parallel. So the longer they've been in the cold, the more protected they are. So it's a pure history story. The likelihood of the fly dying depends on the thermal history that it's accumulated to date, which is exactly what we effect, for, expect for a manipulation that affects the rate of aging. The effects of diet turn out to be very different. So again, if we look at the control things, what we can do is to take flies that have uh, been fully fed and actually restrict them for the first time. And of course, we can always do the experiment the other way around as well. And what we find if we do that is that in complete contrast to the effects of temperature, the system has no memory. So if we take these flies that have been fed, there are no bad marks for having eaten in the past. The mortality trajectory just drops down over the next two days. It knows exactly where to go on the other curve, and then it tracks it for the rest of life. And again, it doesn't matter how late you do it. It just drops down and does the same thing. And in both cases, temperature and diet, the reverse switch shows exactly the same thing. So what we've got here is a completely different situation. What this intervention is doing is not slowing down the rate of aging. That irreversible aging-related damage is unaffected. And that's very much confirmed by the fact that they know exactly where to go. They know what the underlying rate of aging in this group is. Rather, what we're seeing here is an acute protection of the animal from dying of the effects of the aging that's happened to it. There's some sort of acute protective effect going on. And with data that I don't have time to show you, one can ask the same question in flies with insulin signaling. Because you can actually switch the insulin signaling status of the animal partway through adulthood. Um, there are inducible systems for gene expression in the fly where you just feed it a chemical in the food that turns on the expression of a transgene. And if you do that with the insulin pathway, the death rates of the fly switch, just like they do for dietary restriction. And interestingly, if we look at the mortality plots, nobody's done these kinds of reversal experiments in mice, but if we simply look at the shape of the mortality plots, they look much more like this for both dietary restriction and long-lived mutants in mice than they do like the temperature plots. So perhaps the same thing's going on there. Who knows? But I think rather surprisingly from all this basic work on aging, what's coming out is a very strong message actually for the medics which is that if you want to protect against aging-related disease, what you've got to do is to protect the animal against the underlying aging process itself. You may not be able to alter the aging process, but clearly you can protect the animal against disease and death from aging. And to rather parody the situation, I think what we're seeing at the moment with the aging-related diseases is a rather 
I hope not offending anyone in the audience, balkanized um, approach, which is the research on all of these diseases tends to be done by different um, communities who are working in different institutes, who go to different conferences, read different journals, belong to different learned societies, and often don't communicate with each other very much. And that kicks on to treatments for the various aging-related diseases. But what I think we're seeing the prospect of here, and what I think we've really got to convince the medics about, is that what we should be doing instead is looking at the underlying aging process as a way of intervening in all of these diseases simultaneously. Really what we're looking for is this broad spectrum preventative medicine, and I think that's what this work has told us. So to summarize, what we're looking at here is an unprogrammed process that's just evolving as a side effect. Nutrient sensing pathways are clearly important players and can ameliorate the effects of aging. The long-lived mutants maintain function better at older ages and are protected against aging-related disease. And I think this is pointing to a broad spectrum preventative medicine for aging-related disease. And finally, it's an enormous pleasure to acknowledge collaborators and funders, several of them in Zurich, actually, particularly people in Ernst Haffen's lab, with whom it's been a great pleasure to collaborate over the years. And thank you very much for your attention.